Well, hi there. This is not a jumping spider. And you can really tell the difference when you look at their eyes. Jumping spiders have two huge, highly expressive front-facing eyes. This not only makes them cute, but also gives them a real sense of intelligence. Personally, I'm not sure jumping spiders are so much more intelligent than other spiders, but being visual creatures ourselves, it's easy to get into their headspace. Or prosoma space. You know, since they don't have heads. This spider, the ladybird spider, also has a pair of forward-facing eyes, but they're not nearly as large as those of the jumping spider. But that isn't the only difference in their eye structure. Both jumping spiders and velvet spiders have eight total eyes, and both have four that face forward, with one pair more pronounced than the other. In jumping spiders, the second pair is also very large, though smaller than the innermost pair. And they're located to the outside and slightly higher than the larger pair. In the velvet spiders, the second front-facing pair is located between the larger pair of eyes and slightly below. At a glance, it almost looks like a lacrimal caruncle. You know, that little pink dealy in the inside corner of your eye. While they don't have the over-caffeinated, wide-eyed stare of the jumping spider, they still have a very relatable, almost human look to them. Just more of a calm, sad-looking person. Maybe the way you would look if you watched your mother slowly sacrifice herself for you and your siblings until she could give no more, and then you all ganged up on her one day and ate her alive. They kind of look like that. Almost cute they look so sad. That second pair of eyes might just be a little teardrop coming out of each eye as they look back on what they've done. Are they good mothers? Yes. Good sons and daughters? But do they make good pets? And is the ladybird velvet spider the best pet arachnid for you? To figure this out, we will have to give these dewy-eyed little cuties with the checkered past a score based on our five categories, which are handleability, care, hardiness, availability, and upfront costs. When it comes to handleability, we give the ladybird velvet spider a score of three out of five. That's a pretty good score for a little spider, but you may notice that it's lower than our score for jumping spiders, and there's a good reason for this. In many ways, they are similar to jumping spiders when it comes to handling. They have about all of the same cons. They're little and subsequently at great danger of being harmed if you mess up while handling them. They also can bite and are mildly venomous. This is unlikely to happen unless you pin one to yourself, though. The only real reason that they get a lower score is because they are much less adventurous than jumping spiders, which you wouldn't be able to tell from watching this one today. They tend to spend most of their time hanging out in their little silk homes, so getting one out to handle it is much more invasive and difficult than it is with jumping spiders. You can handle them easily and safely whenever you need to get them out of their enclosure, say for cleaning or to move them into a larger one, which is actually what we're doing today. But most of the time, it is probably best to watch them and not handle them. If you want a little spider like this that you can handle regularly, probably consider one of their wide-eyed cousins. When it comes to care, we give the ladybird velvet spider a score of 5 out of 5. Like most spiders, it isn't rocket surgery. But just because something is not that complicated, that doesn't mean that it's easy to find out what it is. Try looking for care information about these guys. And, as it turns out, there are a couple of very simple mistakes that you could easily make that would kill them. So it's a good thing that our friend Russ from Aquarimax Pets is here with us to shine some light on how to care for these adorable little monsters. My velvet spider, Erisus species Blue CD, is one of the easiest arachnids I have ever kept. Velvet spiders do great at room temperatures, and they come from a pretty xeric environment. So if you live in a dry climate, as I do, maintaining the low humidity level at which they thrive is not difficult. Along with dry conditions, velvet spiders require a good amount of ventilation, so enclosures like this one, which provides ample top and cross ventilation, are great. Various dry base substrates work fine. I'm using cocoa fiber here as the base layer, and on top of that, plenty of dry sphagnum moss. Most velvet spider keepers regard sphagnum moss as an essential accoutrement, probably because the spiders really seem to prefer it as a base for their webs. Add some cork bark, branches, and or some rocks, and your enclosure should be good to go. If the spider arrives with a web already constructed, you can try to relocate the entire web and any decor it might be attached to, to the new enclosure. If that doesn't work, no worries. Just give the spider a week or two to construct a new web before you try to feed it. Feeding is straightforward. 
For the spiderlings, offer flightless melanogaster fruit flies, and then as the spiderling grows, it'll take the larger fruit flies, Drosophila hydei or hydei, I've heard it both ways. Eventually, you can shift the spider's diet to crickets, roaches, and mealworms. A velvet spider can handle prey up to its own size, but some may prefer food items that are a little bit smaller. Keeping your velvet spider hydrated is simplicity itself. Velvet spiders can and will drink droplets of water, as seen here, so some keepers offer a few water droplets occasionally, maybe once a month or even less often. This seems to work just fine, but in an effort to keep the enclosure properly dry, other keepers don't offer any water droplets at all. And this also seems to work well. Apparently, velvet spiders are capable of getting all the water they require from their food. So if you do offer your pet a drink, don't do so too frequently, and don't let humidity build up in your spider's enclosure for any length of time, or you could end up killing it with kindness. Don't expect to see your velvet spider all that often. They tend to spend most of their time in their little web tunnel, so unless your spider builds its web in a visually favorable location, it will be hidden. That said, since my spider molted out into a mature male some weeks ago, it has left the web much more often, presumably attempting to find a mate. The bright side of getting a male velvet spider is its beautiful patterning, and in some species, absolutely brilliant coloration once it reaches adulthood. Sadly, a male terminal molt means its days are numbered, but if you end up with a female, you could enjoy your velvety friend for five more years or so, unless she becomes a mother. And as Clint will explain, that's not gonna go well. Thank you so much, Russ. It's honestly been so difficult to find good care information on these spiders. If you guys don't already subscribe to Aquarimax Pets, you should go over there and check that out right now. When it comes to hardiness, we give the Ladybird Velvet Spider a score of three out of five. For starters, these are true spiders. And like most true spiders, their total lifespan isn't that long. Though females can live over five years, maybe even longer if they don't breed. Males, like this one, probably closer to two years. Lifespan may be longer if you reduce their feeding schedule. But you notice that I said, if they don't breed. You may also remember the sad look they all seem to have on their faces. You know, the sad look from watching their mother sacrifice herself and then ganging up on her and eating her alive. You remember that sad look? Well, it turns out that they look that way because that's exactly what happened. Female velvet spiders liquefy their insides and feed it to their offspring until the stress of this act prevents them from continuing on to care for their offspring. At that point, the brood gang up on her and eat what is left of her. So females don't survive reproduction. It's like an even more horrifying version of Charlotte's Web. So if you choose to breed your ladybird velvet spider, that will be the end of the road. But they're otherwise fairly hardy unless, as Russ already explained, humidity gets too high. This is easily avoidable for us here in the desert, but may be very difficult to avoid for those of you in humid climates. When it comes to availability, we give the ladybird velvet spider a score of two out of five. For starters, velvet spiders are only found in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Brazil. If you live in one of these places, you may be able to just find one. The rest of us will need to buy one. And for some reason, not too many people are breeding them. I would imagine puppies would be harder to get if mother dogs fed them with their own liquefied innards instead of milk. And one day you would come home to a ghoulish, gruesome scene and a bunch of puppies looking fat and guilty. Anyway, I've never seen them in a pet shop. I would be surprised to find them at an expo. And they're not even easy to find online, though it probably helps if you know the right people. You could try asking Russ in the comments for his videos on Aquarimax Pets to see if uh, he has any leads for you, you know, if you're in the market. When it comes to upfront costs, we give the Ladybird Velvet Spider a score of four out of five. The spider is fairly expensive for a true spider, probably in the neighborhood of $100. That's not crazy, but for a true spider, it's a lot, especially if it turns out to be a male. But it doesn't shock me given the cost of breeding them. I mean, human children get the lowest score we've ever given on this channel, but imagine if we were velvet spiders scoring our offspring. After the spider, the rest is fairly inexpensive. An enclosure with ventilation from which they cannot escape, substrate, things to climb upon, done. It's a spider. And that is why, overall, we give the ladybird velvet spider a score of 3.4 out of 5. But we haven't addressed a very important question. What's a ladybird? Well, ladybird beetle is a common name for what we here in the United States often call ladybugs. Of course, 
They aren't bugs and only half are ladies. So ladybird beetle is more accurate, though I, I still don't know why they call them ladybird. At least they're beetles. But it turns out that many of the male ladybird velvet spiders are red and look a lot like ladybird beetles. And if what you want is a spider that looks somewhat like a beetle that we call a bug, that ate its mom but is somehow still adorable, then the ladybird velvet spider might be the best pet arachnid for you. As always, like and subscribe. Be sure to check out Aquarimax Pets, and we hope to see you real soon. And then you all ganged up on her one day and ate her alive. They kind of look like that. Almost cute, they look so sad. This <laughs> 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 yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> I can totally imagine. Jeez. <laughs> One day you would come home to a ghoulish, gruesome scene and a bunch of puppies looking fat and guilty. Anyway. <laughs> it's too far. <laughs> Let me deliver that one one more time. I had to make sure I made it through. <laughs> I'm just imagining the fat Dalmatian. 101 Dalmatian. Yeah. They, they come on. <laughs> I'm hungry, mother. I really am. If you noticed that, uh, there are some ghoulish references in this video. You might really enjoy hearing us talk more about this phenomenon and just seeing us laugh about it. And as always, there is a whole extra video on our channel called Patreon Extras available to those that support us on Patreon. So if you'd like to see that or, or just support this channel or check out all the other amazing content we have for our patrons, please consider hopping over to Patreon.